Hello and welcome to the Raptor Show on the Sportsnet Radio Network, brought to you by Campbell's new Chunky Spicy Soup. It's time to get fired up. Make sure you find the Raptor Show wherever you listen to podcasts. Please rate, share, review, subscribe to the program. I'm your host, Wayne Blue. I'm joined by co-host Blake Murphy. Today, we have... Look, we have an idea that we wanted to execute while the Raptors were on their 15-game losing streak. It feels a little bit weirder now that they've won two in a row, but let's be real, the Raptors have been very disappointing this season. And this was alongside of obviously watching uh, the women's final where South Carolina or South Carolina. Wow. Um, <laughs> but we we're, we're watching the, the women's final uh, on, on the weekend. And uh, what we saw was uh, the whole media room got embroiled in this big discussion about the most unfortunate moments in uh, this Raptor season. So, we are going to do our worst moments of the 2023-2024 Raptor season draft. And joining us is an, an expert hater, I would say, uh, Eric Kareen of The Athletic. Please say your credentials uh, when it comes to hating. Um, you know, I, I was super into the Smashing Pumpkins in grade five um, at when the double... Uh, CD, double album, Melancholy and the Infinite Sadness came out. Um, so I don't know if it's hating so much as uh, just being dark and down mm. and and moody. But, it, you know, for a long time, uh, my pinned tweet, and I believe this was posted uh, right before game four of the 2018 Eastern Conference semifinal against Cleveland. Mm. It was a uh, sad season as when I shine. So, uh, you know, I take, I don't know if it's hating, okay. but I take note and take some sort of, uh, I think this is really, you know, the dark, the miserable, the, the kind of hilariously bad, unfortunate, uh, that that's really, you know, my, my wheelhouse, I would say. Yeah, you're in the pocket when things are uh, like. Obviously, look, you did a great job covering the the championship blah, run, blah, blah. and when things were good. But <laughs> Who yeah, remembers that you're in the pocket when everyone is uh, everyone is upset and needs to be guided through that infinite badness, as it were. Um, you need <laughs> the good. the nice thing about you being a Smashing Pumpkins kid because like. Uh, I, I would assume you would have grown up even uh, more poorly adjusted than you are, is at least you didn't adopt, like, the Billy Corgan giant scarves that became, like, the signature point of his uh, personality as an adult. So um, kudos to you for avoiding that part. Um, how much, like, when you, so heading into this draft where we're going to try to figure out what, what were the, the lowest lights, you just finished your year-end awards. How, like, you do that year-end award every year, you solicit um, contributions from from your readership and stuff like that. You've been doing that for like over a decade. Was this the worst it's felt since like pre Masai to to put together the year end? Um. Oh, I mean the Tampa Tank year was close. I would say the Tampa Tank year was less memorable. Mm. Uh, like there was the one overarching big story, which was hey, the Raptors aren't playing a home game this year. Uh, there were like. There was the Pascal Siakam issues that he had with Nick Nurse uh, um, that got him suspended for the one game. And and maybe we'll get into that uh, tangentially in this draft uh, by way of another moment. Um, and there was the trade deadline where Kyle Lowry was not traded and <laughs> we were sort of left to wonder what was going to happen. And, and the season ended, of course, with six players, including three centers. Uh, Kem Birch, Aaron Baines, and Freddie Gillespie making up that six-man rotation. So that that was uh. right up there. Uh, but this year, I, I think just in terms of, you know, moments that ran from sad to, like, unwatchable play to, like, sort of comedically awful to, like, a, a sense mm. of, like, you know, with the way the Raptors closed out, an era basically you know a, a sense of finality and new beginning like there were all sorts of moments and storylines that you can lump generally into bad i think yeah uh i was gonna have you know i had this idea of like stating maybe outright like why the season's bad like stating the record or this and that or whatever but i think you guys just nailed it like this year was actually much worse in tampa which um i will maintain that I think Tampa in my head is going to remain worse because I went down there. I spent okay. time in Tampa and I got a sense of how soulless it was. I watched games in like 
empty arena, empty-ish arenas where like everyone was cheering for like people were wearing Zion Williamson jerseys and like uh -huh. cheering for the Pelicans in like a Raptors Heat game. Uh, it was just it was a uh, odd, odd. And like everyone looked so sad every time I saw them. Mm. It was, and I was only there for a couple weeks. Well, I, okay, you know what? That's fair. But I think for the viewing public, people were just like, "All right, Raptors suck," and then they just disconnected. It's not. It's not just about me. Uh, no, actually, unfortunately, <laughs> it isn't. But in this case, like, yeah, I mean, this this season obviously was pr was pretty tough. So as we always do when we do these drafts, uh, we are going to let the guests have the first overall pick. Uh, I guess typically I would have the second overall pick. You can have the second pick. I don't and care. then yeah, I mean, Alex. We did a lot of drafts with Alex. Yeah. He would always pick third. Yeah, there's a lot of really there's a lot ones. of material here. Yes. So this is, this is the worst moments of the 2023-2024 draft with the first overall pick, Eric Kareen of the Athletic. What is your pick? Uh, before we get this out of the way, just any ground rules we need. Like, does it need to be one single moment? No, or can you can it be kind an of ongoing storyline. Yeah, you can kind of do with what you need to. Um, obviously, there are certain things that uh, which we we talked about beforehand that we're just not going to touch yeah. because it's not in the spirit yeah. of this segment. Um, but yeah, you can like if it's an overarching theme or like I have a couple like that on my thing. You can't just be like the season and take the whole season. But if you need to take something a little uh, a little wider in scope, by all means. Yeah, don't worry. We have two other people here who can veto you if it's like <laughs> too general. Yeah. 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 Okay, so my moment of the year in my column at The Athletic uh, was December 30th, 2023. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure I can do that because it takes two very different stories and mashes them together. I would say so pick, I will take, pick one, yeah. I will take the Detroit Pistons loss Ooh. first overall. Um, and the reason I do that is not because it was unexpected. I almost do it because it was expected. <laughs> because we had this game uh -huh. uh, circled on the Raptors calendar, uh, you know, probably middle of that month when things started to go. Like They got off to the okay start. They were 8-8 eight and eight or close to it. And then things started to go wrong. The offense wasn't producing as much. The defensive capability of this team was just not showing in the way you would expect it to. And things were getting bad. Uh, and then another thing happened that day to make their chances of them winning mm. even worse. Meanwhile, the Pistons are on a 28 game winning streak, a losing streak, not a winning streak. Uh, and, and I was talking to my colleague at the athletic James Edwards, who does a great job um, covering the Pistons. And a few days out, I'm like, you get ready to, to write your streak ending story on uh, December 30th. He's like, <laughs> You know, all all the beat writers say that. I'm like, yeah, I'm sure they do, but I'm right. <laughs> yeah. uh, and, and and I was. I, I, I don't like to brag when I'm right. And it just, to, to wrap a bow on this conversation, it sort of put a symbolic finality, uh, finality on the era the Raptors were leaving and is like, well, here are the dark times ahead that come with what's next. Um, so I think both for the defeat itself, which maybe isn't as bad as losing to that team suggests, and we've all agreed that the Pistons weren't talent-wise as bad as the record, but also what it means for the Raptors, a championship organization five years ago, uh, that is the single worst moment for me, uh, and I'll take it first overall. Yeah, I, 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 you know, I'm happy you took us through the entire day because I think when we look back on it, it's like, okay, the Pistons were on what at that time was the tied uh, longest losing streak in NBA history and at 28 really, games. In my yeah. mind, the longest. Like one that, because the, the record that they tied yeah. spanned multiple seasons. Right, okay, so the it's longest like, like if the Raptors season. hadn't won these two games and they ended the season on a 21-game losing streak, would you consider the opening night loss next year a 22-game losing streak? I wouldn't. Right. So That's to, me, to me, they had the record. Okay, so yeah, the NBA record for longest losing streak. But it wasn't even just about losing that game to the Pistons. It was also everything that went on that day. There was obviously the OG trade that you're mentioning, which probably will be drafted at some point uh, in, in shortly. Um, there was also the just, I can't even say, but the, well, uh, Dennis did say post game. He's like, yeah, the team culture here is not very good. <laughs> if, to, to paraphrase, let's be honest, right? That's yeah. what he said. So like, yeah, I mean, there was a, was a lot that went into that specific day. Um, this is a team culture yeah. that would, make me go off the bench 
Oh well. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Anyway, say. it's uh, it's your pick. That's, well, a, that's so a great pick. I mean, you could take. There are a handful of dentist things you you could take as well. I don't no, think no, they're no, going no. as high as number two, but uh, have your pick here. Uh, my my first overall pick actually was going to be uh, losing Alex from the Raptor show, but uh, what I was actually going to take is Jonte Porter the betting scandal. I mean, like. Look, we are still in the midst of finding out more details about this, right? Um, the the league is investigating. You know, uh, I'm sure additional commissions are going to be looking into this specific thing. But the very fact is that, like, and I think this is actually where we decided to come up with the idea to do this draft for the year. It's like, what else could hit the Raptors this year? Like, let's be honest. What else, right? We are talking about Jonte, who prior to this was like, well, you know, uh, the Raptors had injuries and they signed Jonte and it was it was going well. He came on the Raptor show, did a great interview with you, Blake. That turned into a, a great feature that you wrote on him as well. And, you know, generally speaking, it was like, okay, he was solid. Like, you know, we're probably going to bring him back next year. And then all of a sudden, you see this ridiculous betting scandal. And again, I, I, I still can't wrap my mind around if this were, like, absolutely true based on what, what was alleged. And the pattern was that he was checking himself out of games early so that he can hit the unders. And not maybe just not even him, but other people as well, because it seemed like it was the biggest bets of the night or whatever. Um, it is just one of the worst concocted, like, uh, you know, scandals or controversies. Like, it's so easy to figure this thing out. It's like, wow, all these people are betting on Jonte Porter unders, and uh, that's not suspicious at all. In any case, the fact that, yeah, I mean, your third string backup center that you signed midseason ends up um, not even being available and also causing a big big point of controversy is just incredible. So I, I got to take Jonte with the first overall pick. Yeah, that's a, that is a very, very good pick. Uh, I think um, that was number one on my board as well. Let's go. Um, all right. So mine is a more broad kind of philosophical thing. Um, with my first round pick, I am taking just this idea of tanking when you don't control your pick mm, that has okay, informed okay. the entire second half of the season. Um, even now the Raptors coming off a 15 game losing streak, the second longest in franchise history, they still have only managed to get to six last in the standings. And that's in large part because it's an historic year in terms of how many teams are only going to win 25 games or fewer. Um, the Raptors are at 25 right now and they're in six to last like that. Never, it never happens. Usually 25 is enough to get you closer um in into the lottery uh the other part of this is in addition to not controlling your pick because again the raptors owe their pick to san antonio top six protected so even getting as far down as six to last you only have a 45.8 percent chance of keeping the pick through all of this they mm. go on a 15 game losing streak they did not move in the standings <laughs> they broke a tie with memphis oh, wow yeah that's it wow so they got a shred of a percentage of X. Instead of splitting the sixth and seventh odds with yeah. Memphis, they have the sixth alone. They got a tiny bit extra chance of keeping the pick. Some people don't even want to keep the pick. They'd mm -hmm. rather get it out of the way now. So for me, the number one overall thing, is, or my, my number one pick is just this whole idea of playing out a string, not caring about wins, but also not controlling your pick. And some people not even wanting to keep the pick. Mm. It's just been such a mess in terms of, motivation and like what like you can't even root for either outcome really it's it's yeah. been very difficult to figure out what what matters in that yeah it's like typically around this time especially if you're a 25 win team you'd be like all right let me look up the draft boards watch some videos you know who is maras uh Bizuelas or whatever you know like just like just watch some videos and just imagine you know and like halfway through the video you're like yeah but we have a 50 percent chance of this guy maybe yeah. you know so it has definitely caused a lot of strife and uh, concern over the season. Great pick. At least you have your pick. Uh, Eric Green, your <laughs> second pick in the worst moments of the 2023-24 uh, Raptor season draft. I will say that Jonte was, uh, that was third on my big board. Mm. I didn't have what you took, Blake, uh, just because it wasn't a singular moment. But my advice to friends when they were asking what to think about the stretch and losing versus winning is just like, don't think about it. There's too much we don't know mm. in terms of whether this draft is good. Like if the seventh pick equals the 13th pick next year, et cetera, et cetera. And yet down the stretch, that's like the main thing I've been monitoring. So great pick overall. Um, with my second pick, I think we can agree. It was an, over, it was a largely positive season for Scotty Barnes. Um, I, I, you know, really pleased with his development, showed great signs. And I'm picking between two negative Scotty 
moments. Uh, but I'm always going to care more about on court than off court, uh, even though I, I, I do think that off court stuff matters a lot. I'm taking the end of the game in Oklahoma City. Mm. Uh, uh, Double Scotty Barnes. Yeah. Um, when he basically disappeared from that game offense, uh, offensively. Now, fatigue might have been a part. Uh, long game. He was having a fine game up until then. And I don't remember now if it was the end of regulation or the end of single overtime. Uh, but he passes to Gary Trent Jr., who has to go one on one with Shea Gilgis Alexander, which I, you know, I don't think yeah. is an advantageous matchup. Um, he just and when he got the ball, he was just looking to swing it. Basically, he wasn't getting involved in heavy switch and like two man actions, even as a screener. He uh, when I talked to him after the game, he was like, "Well, quickly was cooking, and we were trying to attack matchups." And it's like, yeah, the Thunder have some good defenders, but. You're you have a size advantage on all of them, and you can you know at least get the defense to move a little bit. I just thought his deference in those moments, um, especially compared to like his reputation, well earned as like a very good fourth uh, fourth quarter player. Uh, that's concerning to me because that's that's the guy that is at the center of this thing, and whether yeah. he ends up being a one or a two, you need him to embrace those moments and his performance and his response to that which didn't seem like that well reasoned um that was very concerning for me so i'll take that with my second pick yeah that's a that's a really good one and for people who don't remember that game scotty was playing excellent for the first three quarters he checks back in for the fourth quarter and basically from the midway through the fourth quarter uh, again through both overtime periods as well i think he took like two shots and one of the plays was drawn up for him to take the potential game winner in overtime as you mentioned and he did pass it off to gary um yeah, that, I thought it was a pump fix. I, I really thought you were going to take the Spurs game, but um, me is not a Scotty Barnes Is the Spurs hater. one that he left the game? He went to the locker room early? Is it, that it, the Spurs game? Yeah, it's not just the the leaving the game. It, to me, that was very minor as compared to what happened in the middle of the game. But again, me is not a Scotty hater. I'm just going to avoid this altogether and, and remain the favorites in uh, the Raptors, uh, you know, Twitter uh, Look, space, hopefully. I've got a pick on here that is actually <laughs> pro-Scotty. So, okay, all right, uh, all somehow, right. somehow I'm going to spin it into Scotty propaganda. So you just wait. There you go. Okay, so uh, with my second pick, I'm going to take uh, Pascal being traded for nobody of immediate value. Um, the trade essentially broke the night before, if you guys remember. Um, Shams had tweeted out, you know, or, or it, you know, basically the framework of the deal. We didn't know how many picks what the specific picks were, but it was that Jordan Moore was going to come back and Bruce Brown was going to come back to Toronto. Um, I think, you know, we came in the next day, we talked about it, and then, of course, live on the show, it broke, and we got a lot of good reaction to it. But we talked about it at the time. We were like, honestly, we can we not get a little bit more? Can we not get, like, I don't know, one of the many players in Indiana that were, like, useful in terms of, like, you know, basketball, like, uh, you know, Andrew Nemhard. Uh, I think we talked about Jairus Walker. We talked about Benedict Mathurin. We talked about even Jalen Smith. Honestly, even Jalen Smith. But ultimately, that is what the deal was. Now, the Raptors got the three picks, which is good. That's why I said immediate value, because it not only brought us Jordan Wara and Bruce Brown, it also brought us us talking to Mark Stein every single day on the show about, hey, how much can we get for Bruce Brown? <laughs> and then we didn't even trade him? Yeah. So, yeah, I'm thinking Pascal getting traded with nothing of immediate value. Yeah, that, that's a good pick and a good note in Eric's year-end award piece about how, yeah, like it's not, it's hard to capture as a moment. It's the absence of a moment, but not mm. being able to find enough return for Bruce Brown uh, as like could be, like we're, we're I assume we're not going to make enough picks in this draft, but that would also be somewhere on here of like, yeah, right. like, yeah, everyone thought there was another component to this and then it's gone worse than expected. For sure. Uh, certainly. Um, all right, good pick. Um, I'm going to pick. So this is, again, it's not, I'm breaking the kind of this is a moment thing. It's a bigger thing. But through all of this, the Raptors have gotten very little developmentally out of this. Hey, you're going to give opportunity to a lot of different guys. You're going to see if you can find someone like those guys. Those guys haven't popped. You haven't really found someone. If you did, it was Jonte, who, uh, as, <laughs> as you picked, oh, he got uh, is out of there. Meanwhile, Delano Banton killing it. Jeff Doughton converted to an NBA deal. O'Shea, not, less so lately, but for a good chunk of the season, playing rotation minutes 
for the Celtics. Even Svi playing rotation minutes for the Celtics Bro. at times. Obviously, all the guys the Raptors like Precious breaks out. Yeah. So in how the dare you not say Malika had a fifty piece so and then had a zero piece in the spirit. <laughs> Of this, of uh -huh. the Raptors have really struggled to get anything out of the margins through all of this when there are all these opportunities going around, through all these guys who have left Toronto really succeeding more than they did here. I am selecting the Malachi 50 oh! piece spe as a oh! like spiritual avatar for <laughs> yeah. the trouble developing uh, and getting the most out of, out of that on the uh on the, the roster this year. So it's not really like, I don't want to be mean to Malachi, even though he did score three points over the next two games after dropping 50. <laughs> and it, and it is like by far statistically the most unlikely 50 piece in NBA history. But yeah. that as kind of like what that symbolized to me is like yeah. everyone who leaves keeps doing really well. And nobody mm -hmm. who is here has run with the opportunity. Got so you. the Malachi 50 piece was uh very representative, I think. All right. That, I, I did not have that on my board at all, so... The Malachi 50 piece? No, no, no. Uh, That's, I mean, I was just happy for Malachi, but it, I totally understand what you're talking no, about. No, it yeah. means more than Malachi. Yes. Um, yeah. The analogy of the, the 50 yes. piece. Okay, Eric, your third pick, and we got to go a little quicker because uh, sorry, we still have three more rounds. No, 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 not you, all of us. Yeah. Yeah, all right. Both of those were on my board. Good picks. Uh, I'm deviating from my board here to diversify my portfolio a mm. little bit. I'll take us back to media day. Oh, when man. When... Masai Ujiri answered a question about Pascal Siakam uh, by talking about the team's selfishness last year. Um, I didn't think it was an incredibly meaningful moment at the time, and I, I sort of insisted people were making a, too big of a different a deal of it as uh, sort of you know the you know how Twitter mm. uh, is on media day uh, and you get all these quotes and I remember seeing from somebody oh the vibes are really bad in Toronto and I'm like well if you take the full context of Masai's quote and what he was talking about like it wasn't just Pascal Siakam he was talking about he was talking about the way the team played last year uh, but in hindsight after the summer that happened with the trade talks after the you know what happened with possible extension talks and where that did and did not go. You just cannot answer a question specifically about Pascal Siakam and think about, I'm not shying away from talking about it. This team played selfishly last year and that's not going to happen again. Mm. It just, you know, it sends for a guy who's so good at speaking, that's, you know, one of the things Raptors fans rightfully so love about him is, is he can really, you know, work a crowd and, and get the message delivered correctly and enthusiastically. I think it set a bad tone for this season. I don't blame him for like for this season, but just as as going into this season, you didn't need that on day one. And uh, the more and more I thought about it, I was like, that's sort of an unforced error from Masai Ujiri in front of a microphone, which you just generally don't see. Um, so that's my pick. Yeah, that's a that's a pretty good one because when you said media day, I got panicked because similar to media day, and this is something that was asked a lot at media day, and this is like so long ago now. But with my third pick, I'm gonna take Sham Sharania accidentally tweeting out a framework that would include Damian Lillard going to the Raptors. Uh, the tweet from Shams, um, which obviously became deleted, and it was not fully obviously fleshed out. It's like a shell. It was a draft, but Shams had accidentally tweeted out this draft sources. Portland, Toronto, and Phoenix have agreed to a four-team trade. First off, that's only three teams. Okay. Raptors get Damian Lillard, Suns, Yusuf Nurkic, Blazers, DeAndre Ayton. Now, here's the thing. Yusuf Nurkic did go to the Suns, and the Blazers did get DeAndre Ayton. Um, the Raptors did not get Damian Lillard, <laughs> and there are no other details. And honestly, uh, it's a failure of, you know, us on this show. We had Shams twice, and we never asked him about this, I don't think. But, like, what were the other two pieces? I'm just so curious. Yeah. But in any case, did... did send uh, pretty much all of NBA Twitter into a tizzy for a while. Obviously, Dame ended up getting traded to Milwaukee. That wasn't, like, honestly, the, it would have been weird if the Raptors got Dame. I don't think it would have, like, saved the Raptors' season. But I, I am endlessly curious as to what Shams meant with that, so. Yeah. My guess is that those guys have multiple tweet drafts ready to go. Yeah. Uh, at when they know stuff's cooking and he just clicked the wrong one. Yeah, probably, yeah. It's uh, that's a tough one. I, uh... 
I am not commenting on this for the record. Oh, yeah, sorry. I that's, mean, that's hey, your teammate. Shams is my boy. So, <laughs> yeah. like, yeah. That's, that's uh, how we got Shams on the show twice. Yeah. It was great. Yeah, I'm not yeah. going to put him on the spot about that. Mistakes happen. Look, oh, okay. like, Wo Woj had a trade deadline one, two in the Dennis trade. Woj had Dennis Smith Jr. coming here. And, and James Herbert, friend of the oh, show, yeah, wrote, right. like, a fun piece, yeah, like, yeah. asking Dennis Smith Jr. about, like, what's it like to be uh -huh. in an accidental, like, an errant Woj bomb. Right, right. There's um, accidental Bronsons, and then there's accidental Shams. Wow. Doesn't hit the same. Okay. Blake yeah. Murphy, your third pick. Uh, okay. So this is a pretty straightforward one, but it rendered the entire last quarter of the season mostly meaningless for performance and also what we're learning about guys in the future of the team. And it's Scotty breaking his, his hand or his finger. Um, first of all, it happened on just the silliest play where he's going up and his down hand is the one that gets kicked by Emmanuel quickly as quickly also in the air. Mm, just yeah. a very bizarre injury in the first place. But it, I mean, it, it was the precursor to the 15 game losing streak this kind of soulless end of the season and it rendered hey even when quickly and rj are in there even when guys are playing well etc cetera, etc cetera, you know we're not getting the most important developmental reps we're not getting the most important chemistry building reps um and certainly the most entertaining player on the team has been gone for a, a quarter of the season here yeah it's really good that one's really good it, it didn't help that Jacoperto got injured like the day after and yeah and then the Raptors have basically played all guards in Kalilonek ever since. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But in any case, Eric, you're we're, we're in the fourth round now. Yeah. My scouts are yelling at me because I'm I'm ignoring the top talent on my board uh, once again. Uh, but I'm going to go with the OG Adenobi trade. Okay. Not because it was a bad trade. Uh, it was a good trade. Um, I think they did the right thing. And we'll see OG Adenobi's contract at the end of the season. Uh, or in free agency, I should say. And I think it's going to be very expensive. The return was fine. And <clears throat> to add to that, for a long time, you know, people like me were saying, you got to you gotta go one way or the other. Mm -hmm. This was <clears throat> my preferred sort of path. Uh, saying that, it signaled the end. Uh, there were other things that signaled the end. Fred, Fred Van Vliet leaving and free agency signaled the end. You know, Kyle Lowry leaving you know, a few summers ago signaled the end. But with the Ananobi trade, it was sort of the move that Musa Ujiri didn't make at the trade dead, deadline last year. He now made, and you could sort of picture what was coming. And in a, indirectly, you could picture the losses that were coming. Um especially if they didn't agree to an extension with Siakam, which became very clear that that was not going to happen. So uh, OG and an OB trade signaling the definitive end of the championship era of the mm. Raptors. That's a, that's a good one. Now, now you have like the full part of um, the faithful day, the December 30th, you know, you, you yeah, got, no, that's that. Yeah. You got both parts. That, that's part of why I, that's part of why I took this. It's like, it played into each other. I know they're two separate things and the value proposition again, fine, fine trade. And it's, you know, especially with how RJ Barrett has played, like mm -hmm. that's looking like a, a very nice trade, but it just, it was sad and uh, marked the end of something. Definitely. That's, that's a pretty good trade. All right. That's a, well, first off, it actually, it has turned out to be a good trade for both teams. Uh, obviously OG's just gotta be healthy, but we know he's a quality player. But it has, it's been a good trade for Toronto. But I totally understand what you mean in terms of the significance of what that trade represented. Um, with my fourth pick, I'm going to take... It's controversial. I'm going to take the pizza party. The fact that it took 58 games? The fact that they had a pizza party for three game winning streak, man. What are we doing? Like, okay, it was fun. We all had fun with it. Right? It was like a brief moment of like, you know, okay, we can actually like get off this negativity of the season, which obviously we're, we're recapping here. Um... But the fact that like, when you step back, and I'm sure if you're like a neutral fan of the NBA and you look back, you're like, what are they doing over there? Like a whole pizza party. It took till February 29th, okay, for them to actually finally get uh, the three games in a row. 58 games. 58 games. The Charlotte Hornets, who are below the Raptors in the standings, but the Charlotte Hornets even had a three-game winning streak before this. So um, I, I think I just, yeah, the pizza party, uh, you know, um, I know Darko was like, well, you know, it was supposed to be a dinner. Uh, it was kind of accidentally told to us by Pascal. Pascal was like, I, 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 would you say he was a little surly sometimes, a little spiky sometimes in, in the press conferences? 
Um, but yeah. he did say, he's like, oh, Darko said he'll give us, like, he'll pay for dinner if we win three games. That was back in, like, October when he said that. Also, like, <laughs> we there's trapped a, it for so long. There's an element here of, like, uh -huh. Darko said dinner and Pascal passed that on. I'm pretty sure, like, Alex is the reason it became Pizza Party because oh, we, really? we would just, no one, as <laughs> I, I went back and listened, no one specified Pizza Party and then we just kept talking about it as Pizza Party. Um, so, yeah, uh, I'm pretty sure Alex uh, was the one who narrowed it in. That, wow. like, okay. like, you're welcome from <laughs> Alex uh, via the Raptor show, Eric, for the pizza that media got as part of that Pizza Party. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, the Pizza um, Party is, is a good one. Yeah. Uh, I don't know what you're talking about. We never got anything. Mm. That's mm. right. There was also, yeah. It, 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 let's just say the team didn't want it to be publicized to the degree that it became a, a national story. But, yeah. like, your fourth pick. Yeah, uh, so this is a, a recent one, and maybe there is a little bit of recency bias here. But just a couple days ago, the Raptors suffered the worst loss in the history oh, of the yeah, franchise. Right, uh, the Timberwolves yeah. beat them by 48, and it yeah. was also a week after the Knicks also almost beat them uh, by a franchise record. The Knicks beat them by 44, right. which was the worst home loss in franchise history. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, a couple games later, here's a 48-piece from the Timberwolves. I can't believe it lasted until the 12th pick in this draft. Worst loss in franchise history <laughs> still on the board. By the way, the second longest losing streak in franchise history oh, yeah. also still on the board. That's how bad this season has gotten competitively. Uh, I think we can give you signing Malik Williams and starting yeah. him that very day uh, with that pick. Uh, I think that for, for me, while. that falls into the Malachi Flynn pick of like All development. Right, you gotta... Like you haven't even given me the G League stuff this year. Uh-huh. You got it no matter what. All right. Uh, you, you, Malik Williams uh, and, and him starting is yours for one of those picks. Thank you. Uh, uh, <laughs> I'll wrap it up. Uh, I'm taking the Spurs visit to Toronto and everything that came with it. Mm. Uh, that's probably two picks, but I don't care. No, at this that's point of the draft. Yeah. Uh, they got blocked 10 times by Wemby. <laughs> uh, and somebody said... Well, it's not the last time that it, that will happen. Yeah, but it was the first time that happened. <laughs> uh, so uh, uh, they have that. Scotty Bards obviously gets caught leaving the bench uh, early, uh, slightly before the game ends, which, you know, is a no-no. I don't think it's a big deal, but it happened. It became a story. And to say he responded poorly to it, sort of, you know, running counter to what Darko Ryakovich the next day had said in terms of they had a talk about it. Darko said, or Scotty said, there was no talk about it. And uh, when Michael Grange asked if he, or just mentioned that he was a leader of the team, Scotty sort of went, everybody's a leader, which I guess is fine, but, you know, hints at maybe a guy not yet w willing or ready to take that role. Which is like, again, he's 22, mm -hmm. that's fine. But it's not what you want to hear in the midst of, especially after Adenobi and Siakam are gone, this is your big core piece. And he's not exactly embracing it precisely in the way you'd want. So I have two of Scotty, maybe two Scotty's two most negative moments of the year on mm -hmm. the board. But I, I felt you guys were giving me way too much value in terms of how how meaningful those moments were. Yeah, so he's by far the most important okay. player, so it makes sense that yeah. he'd uh, he'd orbit uh, in this draft. Yeah, we talked this. about it for, I think, two days straight on the yeah. show. Um, yeah, that, and the, listen, that, I'm, I'm a little surprised that that dropped to the fifth round, but to, to wrap up my five, um, a, a lot of difficult ones here because I don't want to leave these There's on the board. There's a lot board. on the board still, yeah, which is hilarious. Uh, what's left on my board, uh, the Raptors, uh, the Malachi um, quote from Darko <laughs> of like, I told him, you have to smile. You're ugly when you don't smile, which is, which is, which is quite good to me. Patrick Beverly saying that the Raptors got no dogs, and the Raptors then proceeding to prove him right by losing three straight to the Sixers. Um, I got Jakob getting injured both times. The Raptors are four and twenty-four without Jakob Pertl this season. In terms of just the number one reason why the Raptors' season really went south is Jakob getting injured in two cru crucial moments. Um, but I gotta take the Raptors getting sued. Like, that was even before the season even started. Like, they just got sued. Again, like, whatever. You want... I, I think, personally, that it's it's a pretty petty thing by the Knicks when you read the lawsuit. It's like, you know, they stole some, like, synergy data. Like, they basically illegally shared a synergy data or whatever the, the suit alleges. But my point is, it's like, it's an assistant... Like, it's a video coordinator? 
It's nothing. Like, like, come on, man. Like, the fact that, like, the, the franchise got sued over this. We still don't have a resolution on this, by the way. I'm sure that both New York and Toronto are pouring way too much money into something that is so silly. But the fact that the Raptors got sued to start the year really just did kick off, like, what was uh, not a good one. So And still made a trade, and I don't know. Oh, yeah, that's right. Nonsense. It's, uh, yeah. And... and- in my, pre- I know we have to be quick. In my preseason predictions column, in which I get bolder, I tried to get bolder and bolder as mm. as the uh, predictions went on. My first pick, so the thing I was most sure of, was that this suit would be settled out of court during the season, and it still has not happened. Exactly, uh, which I think, which I think speaks to James Dolan more than anybody right. or anything. But I find hilarious that the NBA hasn't been able to muscle this one. Uh, out of its, you know, even its rear view, it's it's in the future. Like, I can't believe Adam Silver hasn't been able to make this go away. Uh, small thing, but pretty surprising. Good, yeah. Uh, I would say. Yeah, it's a good one. It's a good one. All right, but the last pick in the draft, uh, an honorable mention here that when the actual games mattered, the 23-2 to two free throw disparity in the fourth quarter against the oh. Lakers should matter here, but it's, it's not counting for... Uh, I'm not picking it for two reasons. One is that... In retrospect, like competitively, it wasn't all that important. But it also let it gave us the best moment of the season, mm-hmm. which was Darko's rant. Yes. So I feel like that undercuts the value of its pick For sure. it, as a pick in this draft a little bit. Um, so with my last pick, this is kind of medical division because there's some stuff we haven't picked that just kind of sucks, but it's it sucks on the side. Like Christian Coloco, who spoke to an Arizona newspaper recently, and there's mm-hmm. still no like clarity on his timeline. Right. Otto Porter retired oh, yeah, uh, that's at, right. at like 31 years old because his yeah. body just can't do it. Mm-hmm. Chris Boucher's injury and just his general treatment this year yeah, right. was on my board. Um, but for the final pick in the draft, and this is a very me pick, but if you're going to have a bad season and you're going to give me any sort of silver lining, it was... Five foot six, two way player Marquise Noel having an awesome season with the G League, making the G League All Star team, one of the most well liked players in the entire NBA and G League on social media. And then he gets hurt and can't play in the All Star game and eventually gets cut. So even the fun G League thing, even the cool, nice underdog story got its legs cut out from underneath it. Uh, Marquise Noel did at least return for the mm-hmm. final game for Raptors 905. So they'll still hold his rights next year, et cetera. But the season being so bad, you couldn't even let us have the five foot right. six underdog G League All Star. You even had to take that. Yeah. Feels really, really personal from yeah. whoever is controlling these things. Um, we really deserve the number one overall pick after recapping this whole season because, yeah, I mean, just to, to wrap up and, and to recap, um, Eric Kareen's, <laughs> I suppose, team. This is their starting five of worst moments. Uh, snapping Detroit's 28-game losing streak, uh, Scotty disappearing in OKC, uh, Masai insinuating that Pascal was selfish, um, the OG trade, and the Wemby 10-block game, Scotty leaving early, uh, Scotty having a bad game in that one, and then the messaging afterwards between Scotty and the and the, the coaching staff just wasn't particularly strong in the media. Uh, for me, I have Jonte Porter's betting scandal. I have Pascal getting traded for nothing of immediate value. Uh, Shams, uh, the the Dame <laughs> tweet draft that was accidentally sent out, the pizza party taking all the way until literally a leap year day to to do uh, February 29th, and then the Raptors getting sued, and then Blake has tanking without control of their first round pick. Malachi's 50 piece as an analogy for all the Raptors who continue to do great outside the organization. Scotty's very very random and very unfortunate uh, hand injury, the 48 point loss, which is a franchise record. And Marquise Noel getting hurt uh, and missing the All Star, the G League All Star, and also getting cut uh, shortly thereafter. Although he is back at least with the 905 to end the the season. Uh, what last week was it? Last week that yeah. he came in. Yeah, um, I'm actually quite surprised that none of us took Jalen McDaniels just full stop. Like uh, I was very con- much considering that. And uh, he's also- he's number one in the mock draft for 2025 though. <laughs> If we had a second round and Mark Tatum came uh, in here, that money is guaranteed. Yeah, well, you know, it can't get worse than this year, can it? But um. And then I also, you know, out of, uh, well, I'm just going to say it. The MLK Crosshairs tweet was also pretty bad as well. But in any case, Eric, I appreciate you so much for joining us. This was a, a good exercise in darkness. And uh, this season will be remembered for that kind of darkness. But Eric, do you have any last things you want to close out on? Uh, a shout out to uh, Brandon Ingram scoring 15 points oh, in five yeah. possessions. Uh, in a row. Yeah. Uh, so, oh uh, yeah. Another 40-point uh, loss, uh, that one. Yeah. 
Well, I, I mean, we all, you know, care about this team and, you know, don't want this team to be, have seasons like this. Uh, at least it was eventful, uh, I will say. It was eventful. From my perspective, um, if you're a subscriber at The Athletic, I have a big feature coming out tomorrow, so uh, check that out. Uh, that's really it, guys. I, I appreciate you uh, you having me, and uh, um, at least we can look back in in laughter, if not uh, and and not anger, for most of these. Uh, and hopefully, we can we can legitimately do a best fifteen things, or at least best nine things draft next year. Yeah. Well, we could have done a fifteen best moments of this year, but uh, we would have to get to fifteen. So we're gonna take this break. <laughs> Thanks. Say Eric. goodbye to Eric. And I've been your host, Willow. You've been listening to The Raptor Show on the Sportsnet Radio Network, brought to you by Campbell's new Chunky Spicy Soup. Welcome back to The Raptor Show on the Sportsnet Radio Network. I'm your host, Willow. You can be joined by co-host Blake Murphy. We're going to talk about the game that's going to take place tonight. The Raptors close out the regular season and I guess the entire season because there's no postseason. But uh, home finale tonight against the Indiana Pacers. Pascal Siakam back in town, uh, 7 p.m. Early tip. They've been tipping earlier i feel like maybe towards the end of the season but of course the schedule has been made uh, all season in any case i'm very much looking forward to seeing pascal and uh you know just how the pacers do going forward but um you know speaking of pascal time now for today's spicy take brought to you by new chunky spicy soup are you ready to get fired up so this is the take for the week you know despite everything we said in the first 40 minutes here the rappers are actually set up well for the future despite how tough this season was. Um, the biggest storyline coming into the year was the resolutions of Pascal Siakam and OG Ananobi. What was their future going to be? OG got back two young starters in Emmanuel Quickly and RJ Barrett that the Raptors will have for a long time, and I think everyone's very, very happy with that trade. Pascal, maybe nobody immediately of value, but it did get you three picks, and it gave you a lot of options there. You can quibble, and I'm sure we have quibbled a lot over the timing of the deals. Maybe they could have got this, they could have got that. But ultimately, in the broader strokes, they got what you needed to do to get from the previous era towards contributing towards the next era. The second biggest line item for the season was Scotty Barnes overcoming this sophomore slump and taking the next step. And in the words of Darko Ryakovich, Scotty Barnes is going to be an all-star. And he was. Scotty finished the season with averages of 20 points, 8 rebounds, 6 assists, 1.3 steals, 1.5 blocks. And basically improved in every category across the board. I think people feel a lot better about the whole situation now. Coming out of last year, maybe a little bit more uncertain. But this year, it's pretty certain it's Scotty's team. And he's got that kind of talent to have a team. You know, we saw that with the All-Star game. And then, since they pivoted to the rebuild, obviously with OG and Pascal getting traded, the last line item on the season was just to salvage whatever they can. You know, Grady, you know, started the season... It, it, there was a lot of concerns. I mean, for the 2023 portion of the season, he averaged 20 or 3.5 points on 29% shooting. Uh, and he even struggled when he went down to the G League. Of course, since the calendar slipped to 2024, he's been a lot better. He's finishing the year on a high note. Hopefully, we see him be able to play tonight. We'll get that update shortly uh, in terms of whether or not he's going to be available to play with the groin injury. But ultimately, he turned it around. We've been able to see what the Raptors ultimately got in him. Uh, we've seen some turnarounds from other guys like Gary over the course of the season. Um, and I think that, you know, the, you know, the obviously bigger picture is the Raptors at least did their best to improve their pick, which is still obviously a 50-50 proposition, as we had mentioned. But at least if the Raptors hit on the 50%, that's good. While the payout is higher than it was before, at least. So, you know, they did that portion-ish. Uh, and, of course, they did shuffle through 30 players. They got to see at least a lot of guys. Unfortunately, not a lot of them hit, but ultimately that is the right process to try to take a look at these certain guys. So, look, it, it was an unfortunate year. There's no doubt that's why we did this episode. But and at least taking a step back for the franchise and taking their lumps this year, the hope is that they've set themselves up well for the future. So that's the new chunky, spicy take. By the way, the Raptors uh, having tried out thir or played 30 different players, uh, 30 different players have hit the court, 32 have been on the roster mm -hmm. at some point, 33 if you include Spencer Dinwiddie. Uh, the Grizzlies sure. just signed a pair of new 10 days. They'll be at 33 on the court after tonight. Goodness. Yeah. Is there anyone else left in the G League that hasn't been signed? Yo, have you been in the G League and you haven't been on the Grizzlies, Raptors, or Pistons this year? I mean, you know, you, you, you might have a long shot. Or, that, or, or Portland, I guess. That is a combined... The I don't know about Portland, but Raptors, Pistons, Grizzlies is a combined 93 players. 
Although yeah, I guess like, technically only 92 because Malachi counts twice. Malachi oh, was yes. on two of those teams. Right. I was going to ask who was on both, but of course it was Mal. Um, yeah. Do you agree with that though? Like, like they at least set themselves up a lot better for the future. Um, I guess maybe. Yeah. I as mean, compared to what they had coming into this year. Directionally, I'm glad that they, they took a, they took a direction. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you could, given the ages, you could quibble still with, um, you know, like the, you're waiting multiple years for those picks to turn into stuff, so, but having the assets is yeah. better. Um, Grady being better these last 36 games, he's played 36 games in a row. He's been their Iron Man in the second half. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, that certainly changes things uh, for the positive because he looks much more ready to contribute. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm with you. I probably don't feel quite as strongly as, as you do about it. I, I think that this offseason ahead, because it sets up as their last time having cap space for a while, because they have a couple free agents and, and, you know, a restricted free agent, a big team option decision, a big unrestricted free agent, three potential picks. They don't, you know, maybe they intend to do one more year in the lottery, but they don't intend to be in the lottery for, for multiple years. Um, it feels like a really, really big off season. Um, yeah, certainly more paths to being good again by 2025 than they had prior though. Yeah. Well, they did come out of it with a lot more optionality. And um, we'll see, obviously, what that turns into. You, you, you got to deliver. But I, I do think that at least they pivoted towards the rebuild. And my hope is they turn it around, you know, relatively quickly. Although I wouldn't be too surprised if next year was similar to this one. Um, but in any case, we could talk about that next year when it comes. <laughs> yeah. We What's going to happen tonight is, yeah, is another game. Time now for Between the Lines, brought to you by Bet Rivers. Take a chance. The Raptors are hosting the Indiana Pacers. It is the home finale. It is very important to the Indiana Pacers who are a game up on Philadelphia and a game and a half up on Miami for that final uh, playoff spot, the sixth seed in the Eastern Conference. There is actually a scenario where if the Pacers win tonight and Philly and Miami lose and Orlando wins, Mm. Indiana could be locked into that sixth seed. Oh, okay. Uh, So they have a clinch scenario tonight. They're going to want this a lot. Even if they, even if all those other things don't happen, their magic number is obviously very, very low at this point that they win this one. They're feeling very, very comfortable with three to go here. The Raptors are 13 point underdogs over under set way up at 238. Um, In addition to this mattering a lot for the Pacers, uh, they only, they're only missing Benedict Mathurin. And then on the Raptors side, Emmanuel quickly will rest. This is the first night of a back-to-back tomorrow. They're in Brooklyn. I know some people would like play everyone tonight because you own the Pacers pick and you'd like them to to get knocked down a little bit and then rest everyone tomorrow. They don't have enough bodies to rest everyone tomorrow. So they probably had to split this a little bit where like tomorrow, maybe you see RJ and Kelly sit or something like that. Um, Grady Dick is also questionable. I mentioned he's played 36 games in a row. He's dealing with a groin contusion. He left last game with uh, sounded like it was still pretty painful yesterday at practice. The beat people didn't seem super optimistic that he's going to play tonight, but he is officially questionable. Uh, Pacers, by the way, seven and three in their last 10, number two yeah. offense over that stretch. And Pascal, by far their leading scorer of late. Yeah, it turns out we gave them Pascal Siakam for uh, Bruce Brown and Jordan Wara. Um, so I, I think that it was going to take some time, obviously, for Tyrese to get healthy, for them to learn how to play off of each other. I do think Pascal, his game is very, like, Especially the way it's grown, it's become more like individualistic, mm-hmm. right? Not not to not to have a basket, not to have a Maasai moment, but you know, I do think that like it does take some little bit of time because the Pacers were playing so free and up tempo and all that kind of stuff. But they were always going to figure it out. They got a big talent infusion, and yeah, it's going to be difficult for the Raptors to 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 play the Pacers this year. They haven't really played them. Well, they had to play, they played them okay this year, but of course we have we've seen so many different teams. No, quickly tonight really does I think put the nail in for me like. It's going to be a tough one. Maybe a little bit of Bruce Brown revenge game, please. But in any case, uh, I think I'll probably go with the Pacers. On that, that was Between the Lines, brought to you by Bet Rivers. Take a chance. Some of the Tyrese Pascal stuff you're talking about is also compounded by they trade away Buddy Heald at the same time, yeah, sure. um, which took away some of Halliburton's pet plays and things like yeah. that. So it's been a readjustment period overall. Yeah. Well, we'll see if uh, a legendary Raptor killer, Doug McDermott, will uh, take up... Uh, buddy spot tonight but in any case uh, that does it for us today i've been your host willow you've been listening to the raptor show on the sports Night radio network brought to you by campbell's new chunky spicy soups time to get fired up thanks once again to our producer amit mon our board producer lance kennedy jennifer olnick david says jared manita for helping behind the scenes big thanks to our guest eric kareen for helping hate on the team that we all cover and uh we'll talk to you tomorrow